Hi, this is the chapter overview video for chapter 9, Linear Momentum and Collisions. This is the uh, second chapter that covers the second of the conserved quantities that uh, we'll cover in this class and in this um, group of weeks before your timed assessment next week. And uh, let me go through the textbook sections, just highlight what we are putting more emphasis on and any differences between your textbook and the lecture. Although in this chapter, um, there aren't that many differences. And in fact, I think in the lecture, I cover all the sections. It, um, it, it speaks to the importance <laughs> of chapter 9 and the idea of momentum. It's uh, one of the things that you will see over and over in your physics class. Um, uh, and even when you don't see it explicitly mentioned, it'll be kind of in the background always. This is one of the twin pillars of classical physics. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, seven sections. Let me just go through one by one. Section 9.1, .1, linear momentum. So your textbook starts the same way lecture does by defining momentum. And uh, in the lecture, I uh, take the uh, time to point out that this is one distinction in how we cover the energy and momentum. With the energy, at least in lecture, we didn't define it explicitly. Uh, we just described it as a conserved quantity. With the momentum, we start out with the definition of momentum. And later on, as your textbook does in section 9.3, we'll be proving that uh, momentum should be conserved uh, through other laws of physics. Um, and I think this section is pretty short, just definition of momentum. Uh, and in section 9.2, we define impulse. And impulse is analogous to work. And it um, defined really similarly as work was defined. It's defined in connection with the force. So work was defined as a force dot product with the displacement. Impulse is defined as force times uh, the duration of time, dt. And here it's not a dot product because time is a scalar, no direction. Uh, and actually one upside of that means is this is a multiplication of a vector by a scalar. So the product remains a vector. So impulse is a vector, unlike work, which was a scalar. Um, so having defined the impulse, your textbook goes through some of the um, kind of application of it. Uh, one way impulse, the total impulse can be used to, is to describe the average force, average over time. And actually, you know, um, force is one of those um, quantities that can be averaged in two different ways. You can either average it over some displacement you are applying, or you can average it over duration of time. And I think uh, you can find examples where those two different averages give you two different um, averaged force. <laughs> so whenever someone's talking about average force, um, hopefully the context will make it clear if we are averaging it over time or averaging it over distance. <laughs> And a lot of times, you know, either you're dealing with a constant force or it kind of doesn't matter. Um, so, so that's the definition of impulse. And uh, you can also see that uh, through uh, kinematics and Newton's second law that you can connect impulse to change of momentum. And that's going to be one uh, important way um, impulse is connected to other physical quantities. And again, analogous to work. So work was defined through its relationship to force. And in back in chapter 7, we've said the reason work is important is because it gives you change of energy. And the reason impulse is important is because it's connected to change of momentum. And I think your textbook makes it explicit uh, here. Effect of impulse, yeah, change of momentum. And uh, finally, your textbook will make explicit one um, one connection, which your textbook actually kind of alluded to earlier. Let me go find it. It's uh, about the definition of force. So in the example above, they wrote down this expression. Uh, it's a boxed uh, and numbered equation. Average force is change of momentum divided by duration of time. Or if you, you know, this is calculus-based physics class, make the delta t infinitesimally small. This gives you force. Force is the time derivative of momentum. 
and uh, way back in uh, chapter 5, your textbook mentioned it, and I said, oh, how nice of them to bring in concepts we haven't covered. But now this is proper place to cover. So this is going to be our actual definition of force. And you can see that it's related to what we've said back in chapter 5, F equals MA, if we assume that mass is constant. So you might wonder, what happens if a mass isn't constant? And uh, this is where your textbook, I think it does say it, if the mass remains constant, yeah. The assumption of constant, pull that down. So if the mass is not constant, we cannot use this form of second law. But instead, must start from equation 9.3. So this F equals MA, that's not actually the definition of force. In, in fact, that's not the way Newton stated it. Uh, the way Newton stated is in this form. This is the definition of force. That is the expression that's always true. And in the rare circumstances where mass is not constant, and um, then you simply don't use F equals MA. <laughs> you use F is equal to time derivative momentum. And you will actually see an example of that. Section 9.7, rocket propulsion, is an example where mass isn't constant and you should not use F equals MA. You should use force is the time derivative momentum. Or um, more precisely, to work out the kinematics of the rocket, you rely on the momentum conservation. So I think that's uh, all the, uh, this is long and important section. So please make sure you um, pay attention as you are reading through it. Also the lecture covers it, basically the same content. Section 9.3, conservation of linear momentum. Um, and uh, your textbook drives the circumstances that leads to the conservation of momentum, the same way the lecture does. Mainly, basically relying on Newton's third law. Uh, so, and when you rely on Newton's third law, at some point you will have to say no net external force. Under the condition, there's no net external force. So all the forces here are of this form. There's a action force, there's a reaction force. When you add them all up, there's no net change of momentum and momentum is conserved. So, um, and so your textbook does the derivation. I think in lecture, I don't, did I? I don't remember if I used the derivatives or not. But it's a distinction of are you dealing with the infinitesimal time or, you know, some finite duration of time. So it doesn't really affect the things. Now, one thing that I will point out is a difference between how your textbook covers and how the lecture covers it. So in the textbook, as part of requirement for momentum conservation, your textbook spells this out explicitly. Um, the way I like to cover it, either um, we always deal with a system where mass is constant, or if we are dealing with something like rocket propulsion, I will define my system large enough so that it includes everything. I do think there are some homework questions where it talks about like water falling onto a cart and then leaking out, then the mass of the water that's leaking out, you know, I just keep it as a part of the system or explicitly refer to the momentum being carried away by the water that leaks out. Um, and so, you know, in lecture, like this is not even a, a factor because the way we define systems, this is never an issue. Um, and, you know, this is very, basically the same. I, I think I, in the lecture, I refined the statement a little bit to make it explicit. It's not the net external force that we really worry about. It's the impulse due to the external force that we worry about. It's, so this would be like uh, when you're dealing with the collision where the duration of time is limited. If you can uh, make an argument that the impulse due to net external force is negligible, then even if there's a net external force, like some uh, kinetic friction, uh, we might still use a conservation of momentum. So, but, but, you know, this is close enough. That's an important system. Now, the thing that I would uh, highlight is something for you to watch out as you continue your physics and science education is um, your textbook gives this definition of closed system and says it, it's uh, also an isolated system. And um, I'll just give you this caution. This way of describing closed system and isolated system 
it's specific to this textbook. You grab a this different physics textbook, you grab a chemistry textbook, you look at um, textbook covering thermodynamics, you might find that the way they define closed system and isolated system is different. So, uh, so in the context of this textbook, it might be okay to uh, use this definition of closed system. Uh, me, personally, I'll just stay away, uh, not just to use the words closed system and isolated system. And whatever conditions it, it is, if it's important, I'll just spell out the conditions. Because really, I, I think uh, um, we physicists as a group don't really rely on uh, universally agreed upon definition of closed system and isolated system. I understand it might be different in chemistry, but... I'm a physicist, not a chemist, <laughs> and uh, so um, so I am aware of different definitions of closed system and isolated system that's out there. So if you talk to me uh, with the words closed system and isolated system, I might have some idea of what you're referring to, but to be where I think it might matter to be perfectly clear, I would just ask you for the conditions that's leading you to say a system is closed or isolated. Because um, it's a, the, one of those words that's not universally defined. Unlike momentum, which is universally defined, or external force, which is universally defined. So, um, so yeah, I think that's uh, and this uh, section has a ton of examples. Uh, I think examples are wonderful, useful for you to read it through and kind of um, um, see if it, it, it highlights any potential misconceptions or teaches you something new. So do read the three examples. Um, again, I think they're wonderful. Um, let's see, what else is there? Yeah, it's all examples. And types of collisions. Um, so your textbook covers elastic collision and inelastic collision. And it covers explosions, which is kind of like a, a completely inelastic collision that's run backwards. <laughs> um, so, you know, the way I use the word collision, explosion kind of fits it because it's a, a time-limited interaction of uh, more than one object, kind of run backwards. Uh, so in explosion, actually, you will gain kinetic energy. It, you can say, oh, it comes from the chemical energy of the bomb or whatever. Or, you know, it could be someone pushing someone else that can also be treated like an explosion. Um, so that's all time. Inelastic simply means kinetic energy is not conserved. Uh, so in an explosion, it increases um, in the uh, coll actual collisions where things are you know coming together. Uh, kinetic energy decreases if it's inelastic. And this is a phrasing that I don't, I'm not in love with. So you will never hear me say perfectly inelastic. The word perfect makes me think of like ideal scenarios where energy is conserved. So I will say completely inelastic, but your textbook says perfectly inelastic. So if you say it, I'll understand what you mean. Um, finally, elastic. This is the beautiful ideal scenario where kinetic energy is conserved. Also, it leads to mathematical expressions that are quite uh, can be complicated because it involves speed squared, v squared. That squaring um, makes algebra tough a lot of times. So whenever you have elastic collision and you are to having to do the algebra to solve, just to uh, strap yourself in for uh, for bumpy ride in terms of <laughs> working through the algebra. You will see examples of that in the lecture. So um, so you know it's not so you know watch the lecture and uh, make sure you um, you uh, learn all the tools of the trade in dealing with the elastic collision algebra and also you know lots of. Um, uh, solution examples in your textbook. Again, they are beautiful. They are good to read through. And, uh, you know, this, uh, I guess I don't cover this in lecture. Um, there's a lot of, so collision is also one of those things that you will see over and over when you, as you continue in uh, physics and uh, engineering education, not just, uh, you know, I mean, you know, collisions that people would normally think about, like, you know, collision of car, but like, uh, you know, subatomic collisions, like uh, modern physics research. And 
when you get to quantum mechanics, we talk about uh, scattering cross sections. It's like upper division, second semester quantum mechanics material. So collision as a concept is uh, something that you will see over and over. Because I think uh, that kind of fits into how we do a lot of experiments, you know, time limited interaction, something happens and you want to analyze the data and make inferences based on that. So. If you take physics 4C, you will see this mentioned more. In the meantime, this is kind of something to look forward to. That this collision stuff we talk about in this class isn't like, it's not just the first semester material. Uh, collisions in multiple dimensions, your textbook goes through formalism of it. You know, your textbook doesn't cover the one example that I thought was most striking, which is the collision where you have a stationary object something else coming in, same mass, then after they collide, there's a kind of a special feature of that motion where their outgoing trajectories are 90 degrees to each other. It's something that you can prove mathematically. I'm a little surprised that your textbook doesn't do that, but um, you know what, I do it in lecture, so watch it in lecture. Uh, we don't deal with the two dimensions um, as much. We deal with the three dimensions never in this class, um, in, at least in terms of collisions. Uh, two dimensions, I think there's maybe one homework problem you have to do. Um, and I think that's fine. Most of the complications, things you have to learn, we can do that in one dimension. Uh, uh, two more sections, okay. 9.6, center of mass. We cover it in lecture also. Uh, I think your textbook covers it basically the same way. Uh, you know, I guess one thing they do it differently, they start with the dynamics. And then having dealt with the dynamics, then they come up with a, a expression for position that might be useful, meaningful. So um, in the lecture, we go it the other way. I start with the introduction of the definition of center of mass, um, but you know they're kind of equivalent. So I recommend that you watch the lecture and read the textbook. It's all good, kind of formal material to read through, get, you know, kind of develop your um, skill reading through these dense technical material. Do that, please. Um, and yeah, so, so from above uh, expressions, um, they get to defining center of mass. Um, and I think above it, it talked about some of the properties that the center of mass would end up having, basically being affected by only external forces. Now, um, and your textbook says, will loosely interpret it to be the weighted average position of the mass of the extended object. The loosely is not necessary. This is the weighted average position of the mass of the extended object, where the weight, uh, the statistical weight that you use is the mass of the object. Like this is the weighted average. There's nothing loose about that. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, that is what center of mass is. And um, I guess in this class, you do, we don't use it as much. There are certain problems where using center of mass gives you solution a little bit quicker, but you can do the exact same question using conservation of momentum. So. So, so yeah, this is center of mass. I think your textbook has some more examples. Do they have an example of using, doing the integral? Um, they might, so they have the center of mass of continuous object. This is how you would define it, make the sum into integral. And I think, yeah, your textbook does have this example of doing the calculation. You know, I, I recommend that you read through these examples. So in lecture, um, I do cover one homework question where I don't do this. But when later on, when we do rigid body motion and rotation of rigid body, at some point I will do an example of calculating center of mass through direct integration. And that is something um, that I want you to learn how to do. It, it's uh, the calculating things through direct integration. It's not something that we do a lot in this class and we don't really need to. But in physics 4B and in your le next level physics classes is where you will need to know how to do some things through direct integration. And this is like your first example of uh, working it out. So I do want you to kind of take some time to read this example, watch the lecture video later on when it comes up. So um, I want you to put that on your radar. And finally, rocket propulsion. Um, I do cover, there's a homework question dealing with the rocket propulsion. I cover it in uh, lecture. 
uh, with uh, some um, approximations. Do please read through this section. It's all good example. And this is the one example where you can't use F equals MA because the mass will be changing. You have to use conservation of momentum. You, um, and yeah, it's, it's, so uh, I guess the homework question that you have, you could just uh, use the rocket equation. Uh, in the uh, homework help video, I solve it without relying on the rocket equation because you can do it using conservation of momentum. Uh, so yeah, that's the last section. Yeah, sorry, this was a very long video. Um, this is a very important chapter. Uh, so please take your time reading through it and um, also watch the lecture videos. And one other thing we do this week that's important is application of conservation law strategy. So now having covered the momentum, you will see uh, additional uh, problem solving examples that will continue to use conservation of energy and now conservation of momentum. So this is the week and maybe a part of next week where I want you to practice applying conservation law um, strategy, problem solving strategy. So thank you, and I will uh, see you in the next uh, chapter overview video.